Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Nick Ashworth. I am a graduate student here at the University of Tulsa in Tulsa, Oklahoma. Uh, and I am presenting today my research on uh, tracking and identifying people and vehicles via the passive keyless entry system. Uh, yeah, it's going to be a thing. Um, so before we begin, uh, a couple of quick like explanation. The vulnerabilities in the attacks that I've done, uh, I have tested on seven vehicles so far, uh, ranging from a 2013 Ford Explorer all the way up to a 2020 Lexus. Uh, everything that you see in this presentation today, so all of the uh, waterfall graph images, all of the image captures, all of the description of the like individual message formats, and even the demo at the end will involve this wonderful 2014 Toyota Prius um, that, as you can tell by the snow on the ground and the current 90 degree weather outside, this is a very recent image. Uh, and if you also didn't notice with the Target uh, trash bag over the front door handle, we take great care of this car, honestly. It's perfectly fine and happy here. I promise me and the other graduate students don't do anything harmful to it at all. Um, but okay, getting into the meat of this stuff. Uh, passive keyless entry. For those of you who aren't familiar, there's two ways that you can use your key fob to get into your vehicle. Uh, the first and most common way that everyone knows is active keyless entry. This is where I push a button, the key fob generates a message, the car receives that message. If everything is correct, it unlocks. The relatively newer way, and newer in this case, I mean starting from, 20, from 2003 on, is a technique called passive keyless entry. Like its name implies, in a passive keyless entry system, you just happen to have, you just have to have the, your key fob on you. And whenever you either touch the door handle to enter the car or push the start button on the vehicle to begin to uh, turn the engine on, the vehicle will generate a message that forces the key fob to respond and it is then able to tell whether or not the key fob is present and whether or not that key fob is the key fob that has been paired to the vehicle without you, the driver, doing anything. This has gotten very, very popular. Uh, over 90% of the vehicles sold in the US uh, in 2020 had uh, passive keyless entry. It's really useful from a consumer standpoint for a lot of reasons, because the vehicle was able to check to see if the key fob is nearby it. Uh, the vehicle can automatically alert you if you're about to leave your keys in the car because it can check to see if the keys are present inside before you go to lock the door or whenever you press the door lock button. Uh, it also is easier on the person because it's one less thing to carry for doing groceries, uh, yada, 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 the classic game of convenience versus security. Um, and so it's something that's here to stay. Excuse me. The basics of uh, passive keyless entry are being broken down into three protocols that handle all the heavy lifting of this, of this whole system. The first is the pairing protocol. Uh, this is the protocol that is used to match your key fob with your car. Uh, this is a very vendor specific protocol. I'll be honest, I wasn't able to get that much info on it, but the basics of it are as a part of PK, as a part of the PKE system, there is a unique ID for your car, and there is a unique ID for your key fob. And during the pairing protocol, those two IDs are exchanged between the vehicles, so that your car now knows this key fob ID is the key fob that it's supposed to listen to, and your key fob now knows that car ID is the car ID it's supposed to listen to. Pretty straightforward. The second one, and one of the more interesting ones, is a thing called the zero battery protocol. I suppose I should also clarify, because all these documentations are proprietary, I don't know the actual formal name of these protocols. These are just what I call them for convenience. Uh, feel free to use or reject those names at your own, dis at your own discretion. The zero battery protocol is the, pro is the emergency protocol used when the battery inside the key fob dies. Uh, so if your key fob dies, you can use the backup key that's inside most of these fobs to get, into the, to get into the car, but because the car uses a push to start system in the, in the, whenever it's enabled with PKE, there's nowhere to use this to actually turn the ignition on. And so instead, what happens is the car transmits a very, very long, like 150 millisecond long message 
that powers up and energizes the encryption chip inside the key fob and allows it to operate and send a quick message that yes, I'm here and yes, I'm, I'm your fob, even when the battery is not present and or dead. Uh, we'll get into a little bit more of how it does that and why it does it at the specific frequency later. The other one and the main thing that we'll be focusing on and the main thing that you actually, the main protocol that you actually use when you're using your car is a protocol called the four-way handshake protocol. This is the protocol that is used every time you touch a door handle, every time you use the push to start system, every time you try to do the trunk. And 99% of the time, this is the protocol you will use whenever interacting with your car. Um, this protocol is interesting because unlike the zero battery protocol where the car is powering up the key fob and enabling it to transmit, the four-way handshake protocol uses the battery inside the key fob, the same battery that's used for your active keyless entry system. Uh, this means that the messages that it generates are relatively high power, at least compared to pretty much everything else that your car is transmitting, such as like uh, TPMS or some of those other systems. And so you have a really long range with this. Um, if you do the free space loss calculations, you're talking up to 90 meters of range. If you're looking at like a real world scenario, you're gonna cut that in half and do anywhere from 30 to 40 meters of range. But either way, all of a sudden you can identify this over RF from really far away. Uh, the other key thing to know, and will become very important, is that the passive keyless entry system on your vehicle side transmits at 134 kilohertz. Now your key fob itself will transmit at anywhere from 315 megahertz, 434 megahertz, some of them will even go up to 900 megahertz, um, and those are all relatively high frequencies. 134 kilohertz is incredibly low frequency for those of you who aren't familiar with RF. And it causes a problem in this space, which is honestly the biggest challenge in all of my research that I like to refer to as the 134 kilohertz problem. So in RF, um, and I will just freely admit I'm an idiot with an SDR, so take all this with a grain of salt, but in the basics of doing radio frequency analysis, when you are designing an antenna to work at a given frequency, you design that antenna to basically be a, um, either on the half wavelength or the quarter wavelength of the, of, the, of the wavelength you're trying to track. So you want it to be an even multiple of either that half wavelength or that quarter wavelength. Now, for 99% of the signals you and I interact with every day, that is not a big deal. Um, Wi-Fi is at 2.4 gigahertz or five gigahertz, depending on um, what which channel you're listening on. Uh, the new five gigahertz signal that your cell phones are gonna use go all the way up to 60 gigahertz. Very, very high frequency, which means very, very small wavelengths on the verge of like, you know, anywhere from meters to centimeters. Um, and thus, you know, an antenna, even for a relatively uh, low frequency signal like AIS, which ships use for identification that operates at 162 uh, megahertz, your antenna length is still, you know, something you, you or I could easily carry. 134 kilohertz though is a really low frequency. Uh, to give you an idea of how low, the wavelength of this signal is over 2000 meters which means the half wavelength is 1,000 meters and the quarter wavelength, 500 meters. Having an antenna that's 500 meters long is a bit of a problem unless you're somebody like the government or you just have a ton of property. Uh, it, it's like absurdly huge for this space. Now, what's cool is because this frequency is so low, you can do a lot of things with it. Um, this frequency travels forever and has very little free space loss because of how low it is. Uh, for example, the picture on the right, the little candy striped towers, that is a timekeeping system in Colorado that the actual antenna is a thin cable that runs across all those poles and it radiates a signal down into, into the earth that bounces off the earth and then kind of glides along the ground across the entire US 
And if you ever had any one of those old radio controlled atomic clocks from like the 90s or early 2000s, this was the frequency it was listening to, no matter where in the US you were. That is like stupidly cool range. Um, the counter to that is you need really, really big antennas. Um, and in addition to that, you need a lot of hoops to jump through if you're trying to talk on this frequency as a civilian. The FCC only recently, um, and by recently I mean like 2017, allowed uh, amateur radio to begin operating near this frequency. Technically, the amateur radio band is 136 kilohertz, but 136, 134 is close enough to not matter for our conversation. Because of that, a lot of your traditional SDRs, like your HackRF ones, your RTL SDRs, um, even your Blade RFs, don't operate at this low frequency. Most of them cap out at anywhere from like one megahertz to 75 megahertz, for example, if you're using an Edis SDR. Uh, the only one that really will go this low natively without using an upconverter is uh, the Lime SDR made by Lime Microsystems. And again, that's a relatively new SDR that came out in around 2017. Uh, at the same time, finding antennas that will operate in, in this frequency range um, that you can just commercially buy is also a bit of a nightmare. Uh, while there are a lot of ham groups that listen in at this frequency, and so you can find receive-only antennas fairly, fairly easily, finding a transmit capable uh, yeah, sorry, finding a transmit capable antenna is a bit of a nightmare. Uh, and that's kind of because the FCC, again, uh, gets to be everybody's best friend because as a part of being authorized to transmit in this band, if you are one of the ham radio groups that actually can talk on these frequencies, you don't get a normal license. Your license is geo-locked to a specific antenna that you will be using to transmit and you must give the FCC the exact, G, the exact GPS coordinates of that antenna. Having some mobile antenna that you can move around completely breaks all those rules. And so most people haven't designed one. Uh, I did eventually find one and uh, I have on the GitHub page that explains this tag, kind of a little, kind of a little bit of running out of it. And it's called the uh, U-Loop, small loop antenna. Uh, this is the antenna that I use to get all of my captures and I'll be using for the attack demo. Um, it's what's known as a small magnetic loop antenna, uh, which basically means it is a loop of wire. Uh, in this case, I've looped it around twice. You can kind of see that. And what that does is a bunch of demon magic that lets you bypass not having to be a quarter wavelength or half wavelength of the signal you're trying to receive or transmit. Now, the downside of that demon magic that allows it to happen is the system doesn't work very well as a transmit antenna. While those big giant poles the size of small houses uh, will let you transmit across the continental US, and if you're in a military system, fun fact, uh, this is a similar frequency to what the Navy uses to talk to submarines at the bottom of the ocean. Uh, again, this thing, there is no free space loss. You can talk for miles and miles. It's really crazy. A little guy like this will not get you that range. Um, and even if you go to a larger like uh, meter, meter uh, long loop, and add on an up converter, everything else, you're still only getting like 20, 30 meters of transmission range with it. Uh, in theory, if you were to design your own antenna for this space, you would probably have better luck. Uh, my background is not antenna design. I, so I don't really know how to do that. If you do, please feel free to get in contact. I would love to talk and learn more. Because uh, I think there's a lot of cool things that you can do, even with the limits that we have, which we'll go over uh, soon. So with that uh, side discretion of the wonderful world of RF out of the way, let's get into how the four-way handshake actually works. So the four-way handshake, as its name kind of implies, consists of four messages. A wake-up message, uh, an acknowledgement message, a challenge message, and a response. 
you're basically how this works is whenever you go to, we'll say, touch the door handle. So I am trying to enter the car. I touch the door handle. There is a capacitive sensor in that driver's side door handle that alerts the vehicle that someone is trying to enter it. That then causes the vehicle to generate a wake up message. Uh, a wake up message, as its name kind of implies, tells the key fob to wake up. Uh, it is a static message. This means that uh, the data inside the message is always the same. In the case of the 2014 Toyota Prius that we'll be using as our demo for today, that wake up message is FFEABA, if I remember correctly. And it will be that way for every 2014 Toyota Prius you run across, or every, uh, I believe it's generation three is the vehicle model, or is the vehicle family of the 2014 model Toyota Prius is in. So in theory, every one of that vehicle model will use will generate this wake up message. Um, and that will become useful to know later on when we get into one of the attacks. The key fob, if it is within range to receive this wake up message, will respond with an acknowledgement message at whatever frequency it transmits on. In our case for today, that is 315 megahertz. So the acknowledgement message is also a static message uh, that basically just tells the vehicle that yes, there is a key fob in range that matches or that is a Toyota Prius key fob. Uh, now you might be wondering why both of these messages are static. After all, it seems kind of useless to have them there. Uh, well, the advantage of having two static messages to start this out is a static message is both very easy to generate and very power efficient. Because you're not dynamically doing any calculations or changing anything on the fly, you can transmit this signal without draining your battery that much. And because the car is sitting there and using its car battery, and because your key fob is sitting here using your little tiny coin cell battery that's in here, battery drain's kind of a big deal on, on the engineering side. And so that's why they decided to make this first half static um, to reduce that battery consumption. Now, once your car knows that there's a key fob nearby that could possibly be its key fob, it generates the challenge message. Uh, the challenge message is a much longer message. Uh, so for comparison, the wake up message on most of the vehicles I tested was around five milliseconds in like total transmission time. The challenge message is about 50 milliseconds. It's a big boy. Uh, that challenge message contains your car ID, a challenge seed, uh, which the uh, key fob will use to solve to validate that it is the key fob it claims to be and a simple little CRC to just kind of do data validation. So what happens is then after that challenge has been transmitted, your key fob will receive that challenge message, will look at the car ID first and see if that car ID matches its key fob ID. Uh, if it does, great, it further decodes the message. If it not, it throws it away and it laughs and doesn't care. Um, it will then take that challenge seed from the uh, from the challenge message and attempt to solve it. And it's a pretty simple cipher, like, okay, we're saying it's encrypted, but this isn't like an AES kind of game. This is like the challenge word is, is A, the password is Apple. The challenge is B, the password is banana. Um, again, battery is a huge issue. Doing a ton of calculations and computations takes a lot of battery power. So things are kind of this. This isn't your normal your normal kind of game, but it's also operating in a space where it's not really expected to get that many hits. Um, and so when your key fob generates that response, your car will look at the key fob ID to validate that it is correct. It will look at the actual response message to validate that it is correct, and then it lets you in. And these, all four of these messages happen in the time span of you touching the door handle and pulling it open. Um, or pushing the start button and waiting for the engine to actually start. So it's relatively quick, quick happenings. Um, it's fairly straightforward. It works the way you think it should because honestly, it's not that badly engineered of a system. It's actually pretty good and useful. Uh, there is one key point. Uh, that will become very important very, very soon on the four-way handshake. And that is 
there's actually a couple different implementations of the four-way handshake, and not all of them are four-way. Because again, cars, why, why do we have standards? Who needs that? No one wants to make life easy or nice. Um, in the traditional implementation, this is what we have shown on the screen. And this is what a majority of the cars that I've tested have used. And based on like reading the literature of some of the other reports of people doing more traditional exploits on Kifa on uh, the PKE system, such as doing really style attacks, this is the kind of system they run into too. So I'm fairly certain this is kind of the, the main more universal of the two. But it is important to know that there is an alternative implementation of this that consists only of the challenge and response messages. Uh, of the vehicles that I tested, two of them, the 2018 Buick Encore and the 2020 Ford Expedition, uh, both used the alternative, this alternative implementation of the four-way handshake. Now, there's a lot of reasons why you would use the alternative implementation, uh, especially on newer vehicles where the key fob will respond back rather in like a rather than instead of like a very simple am on off keying or like a simple little fsk fsk transmission maybe they're using z-wave or bluetooth or zigbee um, up at like the 900 megahertz band well those data links already have a way built into them to determine how close a transmitter is to a receiver and so the wake up and acknowledgement messages can be kind of supplanted by that built-in capability. Uh, there's also the general case of maybe you just used a really large, um, or not really large, but like really high capacity coin cell battery. And so therefore you're not quite as worried as it running out of charge. Both of those are completely viable. Both of these systems work. Um, we do have attacks for both of them and I'll explain those later on, but it is important to know uh, that you will sometimes see a difference, especially if you're doing this research on your own and you're sitting there and you're getting your captures and you're wondering why you're only seeing two instead of four messages, this is why. It just means the vehicle you're testing uses an alternative message uh, or alternative four-way handshake setup. And so the message from the vehicle is just the challenge message and the re response from the key fob is the response. So now let's get into the fun stuff. How do we actually hack and attack this system? And what can we do with the key fob that we care about? So before we get too deep into it, let's talk about radar. Um, most people are familiar with traditional radar, where you have the big giant antenna dish, and it transmits this crazy weird frequency thing at really high power, and it hits an airplane, and it reflects off the skin of the airplane. And then based off those reflections, the dish receives it and does a bunch of calculations and math and says, oh, there's somebody at that altitude and that angle, and they're possibly moving at this speed as I track them. Um, that's traditional radar. Uh, that's the radar that the military uses for like everything because they're the military, yay. Um, but it's not the only form of radar that exists. One of the forms of radar that's especially more common on the civilian side is a type of radar called cooperative radar. Now, in cooperative radar, you have the same kind of equipment, but everything's just slightly different. So, for example, rather than my radar generating a weird signal and watching the reflections, it generates what's called an interrogation, which is a simple message that can be surmised as, as shouting out into the into the darkness, "Is anybody out there?" Um, and the aircraft that is receiving this interrogation, rather than just letting it reflect off of its skin and using the backscatter and all that other crazy physics to figure out where it is, receives the message, decodes it, and sends a message back that says, yes, I am here. Uh, if you're familiar with aviation, this is IFF. Uh, IFF or ADSB are both wonderful examples of a cooperative radar system that works. If you're not familiar with aviation, you're actually also probably still familiar with cooperative radar, just in the form of the pool game Marco Polo. Um, so for those of you who never played it or who haven't had kids who played it or whatever, or are scared of the water, uh, Marco Polo, Polo is a very popular childhood pool game where one player who is it uh, covers their eyes and has to shout Marco. Uh, and he, the, that player is in the pool 
uh, shouts out Marco every so often to try to figure out where everyone else is. Um, the other players in the pool uh, are able to move around. And every time the player that is it shouts Marco, they have to shout Polo. So because the player that is it has their, has their eyes covered, uh, they have to use the sound of everyone's response to figure out where they are and try to navigate towards them and tag them. This is cooperative radar. Um, this is the basics of it. This is also why I decided to name my toolkit uh, Marco after the pool, after the pool game. Um, also because Marco Polo with an SDR looks really, really funny, but it is what it is. Um, so that's what we're going to use the keep up for in these attacks is we're going to basically turn this into a cooperative radar system where uh, I or you or really who any anyone who downloads the toolkit will use an SDR to generate a series of interrogations that will then force the key fob to respond like it was a transponder uh, either in an aircraft or a kid shouting polo if you're playing the pool game. Uh, we have two attacks that we'll go over uh, that I have that work with this. Um, the first is what's called a zero knowledge identification attack. So in this attack, we are targeting the wake up and acknowledgement messages of the four-way handshake. Uh, and how this works is the attacker just basically has to generate a bunch of wake up messages very, very quickly. And the key fob will then respond with its acknowledgement. Now, this sounds simple and spoiler alert, it is, but what you can do with this attack is actually really, really cool. So remember how I said earlier that both of these messages are static and thus they don't change for any of the vehicles of that given make and model and generation? Well, that means that you can attack a vehicle and identify it or identify the driver if the person is walking around outside their vehicle without having to know what the key fob is ahead of time. Because if you are here and you have a library of a lot of car samples, we'll say, like a couple hundred, you can generate every one of those wake up messages and just run through that list. And whenever you finally get a response from the key fob, congratulations, you now know that the key fob is a make X model Y generation Z, whatever. Um, that's a really cool feature in this where you don't have to have any, not any specific knowledge of the vehicle you're trying to attack ahead of time which is why we call this a zero knowledge identification attack. You, I'm able to identify the vehicle on the fly as it pops up or as I care about it. Now, as cool as, as this technique is, it has a couple of flaws. Um, first off, the acknowledgement message is also a static message, which means if I have say two Toyota Priuses right beside each other, the same make, model, and generation, I'll know that there are two because for every wake up message I transmit, I'll get two acknowledgement responses, but I won't be able to know which one is which. So say, for example, uh, we are driving down the, we are driving down the road and I have my friend Bob driving because I'm going to be sitting on the laptop and we are following two, uh, we'll stick with Toyota Priuses just for the example. One of them is red. One of them is blue. I'm sitting here, I'm generating my interrogation, I have my antenna running, I'm seeing the acknowledgements, everything's great. I can validate that, yes, these are both generation three Toyota Priuses because they're responding to that wake up message. All of a sudden, one of the Toyota Priuses turns left and the other turns right. Now, I have no way of knowing, using this technique, which one went which way because all I know is that there are two Toyota Priuses based off the acknowledgement message. I can't tell you which one is the red one and which one is the blue one. And thus, even if I, um, so these loop antennas are slightly directional. So even if I spin it and are like, okay, one is to the left, one is to the right, I'll still know where they are, but I'm not able to identify them at a granular level of which Prius is which one. It would be a flat guess. Um, you, so that's kind of the, the cost of this setup is you can identify everything on the fly, 
but you're limited on your granularity of how much you can look at. You're also limited of being only being able to identify stuff based off how big the library is. And then, as if it wasn't bad enough for our poor little zero knowledge identification attack, there's a third thing he has to he has to deal with. Remember how I said earlier that there were two implementations of the four-way handshake? Well, if you happen to be one of the lucky users that uses an alternative version of the four-way handshake and thus does not have a wake-up message or an acknowledgement message as a part of your activation process, congratulations, this attack won't affect you at all. Uh, so what this ends up meaning is that while it is true, 90 plus percent of the vehicles on the road use passive keyless entry, and while it's true, this kind of zero information attack will work on a passive keyless entry system, uh, you're not gonna be hitting 90 plus percent of the vehicles on the road. My best guess is you're looking at something around 50%. Um, again, I've only unfortunately been able to test seven vehicles for this, partly because of COVID and then like, you know, going over to random people to mess with their car wasn't really kosher with COVID restrictions. And then uh, all the rental car companies sold all their cars. So you couldn't just go to a lot and hop from one to the other aisle to aisle. Uh, so again, if you have a vehicle that you want to help out on this, please let me know. I'd love to, I'd love to talk to you. Um, but while the zero knowledge guy is kind of hit or miss of having a lot of really cool functionality and not requiring any setup, he's all not able to hit that many people. The alternative is what I call a targeted tracking attack. So in this attack, we are targeting the challenge and response messages, which means does not matter whether you're using alternative passive keyless entry or you're using, or sorry, alternative four-way handshake or traditional four-way handshake, this attack will work on you. So this is the attack that will track everyone and everything everywhere which is great, right? Fantastic. Well, again, their great power comes great responsibility. And in this case, great responsibility comes with a slight cost. Unlike the previous attack where we didn't need to know anything about the target ahead of time, we could just basically point an antenna at them and keep trying things until they responded and be like, yep, that's who they are. This attack requires knowledge of the vehicle before you're able to spoof it. Uh, to be specific, recall that the challenge message contains the car's unique ID uh, that is used by the key fob to validate that it's its vehicle. Because we are pretending to be the car, uh, we have to use that ID. But that means we have to solve for it. Now, there are two ways one can get this information. An easy way and a hard way. Uh, the hard way is to reverse engineer the algorithm of the specific vehicle that you're trying to, that you're trying to spoof. Uh, there have been previous papers that have done this in some form or another, uh, mainly looking at the cryptographic chip used uh, by the key fob, uh, which is the digital signature transponder. Uh, people have figured out that a lot of these IDs are based off of the serial number of the car. Um, but you still have an issue of every different vehicle is going to have a slightly different implementation, and so you're going to have to do a lot of math. The easier option, and the option I use during my research, is you just have to capture a single message. Um, all you need is a single challenge message, and you are good. This is because the challenge message is what we like to call deterministic. A deterministic algorithm means that if I pass you a value or a key, your answer will always be the exact same. It doesn't matter how often I pass you that same key or what I passed you beforehand, uh, everything is discrete, uh, hence it's deterministic. Um, recall earlier that I said that this challenge response algorithm is fairly simple compared to a lot of the stuff we're used to in like the web or an IP based system or something like that. As a part of this, your key fob doesn't have any way to validate that a challenge message actually came from the car that is claiming um, to be to be, or that that the person it claims to be effectively. Reason for this is remember all that challenge message has is the car ID, 
your seed and your uh, checksum to validate it. I can just as easily steal Bob's name tag, pop it on. I'm Bob now. The challenge is A, and you know, validate that the message is correctly. Because in in this case of this attack in particular, I'm only really interested in the key fob ID. I don't care what the response is. So I don't need to pass it some different challenge every time. I can pass it the exact same challenge. In fact, it's easier for me to pass it the exact same challenge because then the CRC value won't change and it's just gonna be the exact same message every time. And all I have to look then is, uh, do I get a response? And does that response match my uh, key fob ID that I'm interested in? So this is the attack that I think is kind of like the most useful from a practical standpoint, because while it's true, it does require some previous knowledge, it works on everything. And getting the knowledge needed to attack it is pretty simple. Um, there are plenty of attacks on active keyless entry systems, for example, where the attacker is sitting there and waiting for the victim to press a button on their key fob so that they can capture the rolling code message into it. This is similar, but we're not even, but actually it will, it's similar, but it's even more simple in that we're not even having to reverse the message. Like there's no encryption code that we care about on this. We just need to know the formatting. And so by ripping out a message that works and knowing that all that data is good and valid, we can then go in at any point that we want after we have that data, whether it be today, tomorrow, two years from now, 10 years from now, even assuming the battery somehow is still working, we can track that key fob wherever and whenever we want, as long as it's in transmission range. And that's pretty cool, I think. Um, suppose I should also be nice and mention that I drive 2009 Toyota Yaris that doesn't have a key fob at all. So therefore, I'm not affected by this research. Uh, for those of you panicking right now, I'm sorry. But uh, with that said, uh, let's take a step back and talk about what are the other ways to identify a vehicle? So it's great that we're doing all this stuff with the key fob and like, yeah, it's cool. And okay, most of us just kind of assume that all you would care about a key fob is spoofing it to steal a car. So this is like new and crazy. but we have other ways to track vehicles. Um, we have a lot of ways actually to track vehicles. The most common way that you're probably familiar with is a license plate reader camera. Um, these are camera setups that you can get for anywhere from $1,000, give or take, or sometimes a little less. Uh, they sit on your either your vehicle or on your property. You aim them in a car and basically they do like an open CV Excuse me, they do an open CV algorithm to grab the license plate number, look it up in a database, and tell you who it is. And because every car legally, dri legally driven in the US has to have a license plate, this works really well. These tend to have a range of around 30 meters, give or take. Um, license plate readers can be really delicate and sensitive to light, to angle, because Obviously, all they care about is the license plate itself. They don't care about everything else. Um, and so they can be a little bit, but you're looking at at least uh, the ones that I saw on Amazon, they were reporting ranges of around 30 meters as their maximum expected range. Uh, the other main competition that we're competing against is uh, TPMS, so your tire pressure monitoring system. This is a very simple data link. It's in every one of your tires mandated since 2008 it's completely universal and basically as you are driving along your tires will periodically broadcast to your car what their pressure is um, this happens roughly every 30 seconds when you're moving at speed at speed in this case tends to mean any above either 30 or 35 miles per hour and so as you're rolling along the roads your tires are periodically telling your car what the pressure is this is useful because it can give you a heads up that a tire is deflating um, it'll also happen whenever you first turn your car on so that you'll know if your tires are underinflated and you need to reinflate them. And the whole point of it was to stop people from basically ignoring their tire pressure and having blowouts on the side of the road. Uh, because of where a TPMS sensor is located at inside the tire itself, um, 
it's actually really hard to get captures of it uh, because depending upon what side of the road you're standing on or if you're above the vehicle or something like that, that signal has to go through the entire car. Well, cars are kind of big, heavy, bulky metal objects and you know a lot of signals don't travel through solid metal that well or even mostly solid metal. Um, add to that that TPMS is time independent. You're only operating once every 30 seconds, so it's kind of random whenever you get somebody. And the signals, because they're being generated by the tire, are very, very low power. Here, you're only looking at a range of about 10 meters, um, so relatively short. Now, on the testing that I have done here at the university, uh, which has basically consisted of me, the wonderful Toyota Prius that you saw earlier that is in totally drivable conditions and is not completely stuck on the parking spot that it is currently residing in and will reside into the end of time. Um, I just basically walked around and used parking uh, space lines as a measurement indicator. So full disclosure, this is not a super scientifically accurate test because it's me out in the sun carrying this laptop around and, try, and then using Google Earth to measure how far away I am from where I, th from where I think I'm at. Uh, and that got me uh, roughly 30 to 40 meters, depending upon the trial run of range, using um, the targeted tracking attack. So basically, setting the key fob up, um, I was not using this antenna. I was using a uh, meter. I was using the full-size version of the U-loop antenna, which is about a meter diameter loop, uh, also with a... Uh, with a um, preamp attached to it to, amp to power up the signal. Uh, the reason why I'm not using that here for this demo is because I wanted to A, have the antenna on, on screen, and so doing something that was the size of me was just too bulky, and B, I, general rule of RF, whenever you're transmitting something at power, it's a really bad idea to have them that close. So that's why we're using this antenna today. Uh, but, Using that range, I was able to get close to a really good, uh, really good uh, line uh, license plate camera range without having to see the license plate. Unlike the license plate reader, uh, this attack works in any and all directions because it's RF and your key fob radiates omnidirectionally. Uh, omnidirectionally just means in all directions. Um, so. It all, this attack also has a unique feature in that it works whether you're carrying your key fob in your car or whether you have it on your person, like in your purse or your pocket, which is what we all do with our keys when we're out walking around. Um, so uh, with that said, uh, I have a quick demo that I'm going to do that will basically just show you uh, the generation of the challenge message. I have two key fobs here. This is the key fob that is paired to our 2014 Toyota Yaris. This is a 2014 Toyota Yaris key fob that I bought off of Amazon that is not paired. And so I'll show you how they behave with the challenge message. Um, and then we'll also talk about what you can do to protect yourself against this attack. Uh, so I'm going to stop sharing here. I am going to start sharing. Uh, and so you should now see a waterfall graph. Um, so this is SDR Sharp. This is a open source uh, waterfall generator. For those of you not familiar with RF, a waterfall graph is just a representation of RF power over time. Uh, you can see it's normally blue. Whenever I go here and push the button and force the key fob to transmit, you see we have that nice little that, uh, little spike uh, at the frequency it's transmitting at, and you can see how the the color changes based off the power level uh, that this that the key fob is transmitting at. So we put those over there. Uh, I'm now going to go into uh, I have a little VM running that has all this set up. Make sure everything is connected. That is on. Um, I suppose I should also mention at this point, uh, I have the Marco code all online. It is on GitHub. It is publicly available for you and anyone else who wants to, to download and use this toolkit. Um, it's at uh, ztulsa slash PKE. 
is the GitHub link. It's written in Python and uses GNU Radio. Uh, for those of you who have never used GNU Radio before, congratulations, you sweet summer child. Uh, for those of you who have, yeah, it's a little hit or miss to work, but Marco acts as a Python script that runs on top of that and allows you to dynamically generate messages um, where a GNU Radio module that I wrote converts those into the PKE format. Um, and this allows you to do a bunch of different cars very, very easily. In our case, we are going to do a demo configs and we are going to do a demo message. That all looks good. Uh, this is going to transmit a message once every second. And so if I hold it up here like this, um, hopefully you should both be able to see the little red light flashing every second and you'll see the waterfall graph going on. Now, uh, this gets into a weakness that I forgot to mention when discussing the targeted attack. So your key fob contains a, a really simple cryptographic um, chipset in it called a digital signature transponder. They're made by Texas Instruments. Texas Instruments is like very paranoid about letting data about this chipset out. And that chipset is what is tied to your LED on your key fob, for those of you that have an LED on your key fob. Um, that means that anything that causes that chipset to activate will cause the LED to light up. So in this case, because we're generating a challenge message and forcing a response message to generate, uh, that is that causes the LED to light up. By comparison, if I were to only generate the wake up message and not generate the challenge message, the LED would not light up and you would have no way of knowing that the attack was, was happening if you were the victim. But again, the crux of that is when I'm only targeting wake up, I can't identify you uniquely. Now, by comparison, if I go over here and now use, oh shoot, hold on. Sorry, I had that still pointed at it. Uh, the beam pattern for this guy is, why is that still going on? There we go. Okay. Um, my apologies for that. The beam pattern on this guy is such that he's not going to be activating, which is why if you see the LED doesn't light up on him. Uh, so he is not generating any signals right now. We have someone else transmitting. Don't know who. But yeah, that's the uh, targeted attack. Um, that's the basics of it. So again, this guy will transmit and respond. If I don't have anything nearby him, he doesn't. If I put it nearby him, he's now transmitting and talking, and you can see it, uh, and now he's not. Now, if you are wanting to protect yourself against this attack, it's actually super easy. Uh, so fun fact, when you go to turn on your car, your car doesn't actually care. Um, whether one oh all right i should look up your car doesn't care once it's started if the key fob is present or not this means that you can just basically turn the car on and put the key fob in like a really simple copper bag like the uh thing that they ship passports in and you're fine because you're in effectively a faraday bag the data won't get transmitted out or get transmitted in the key fob won't respond and you're safe um, but that requires remembering to put a key fob that you normally just leave in your pocket or purse and never touch into a bag. And so let's be honest, odds are 99% of people aren't going to do it. Um, but yeah, that is the uh, basics of my research with key fobs in passive keyless entry systems. Uh, again, this is a kind of really cool space because we're using key fobs in a way that like, most people have kind of ignored. Uh, we also have the advantage of being able to go in and t turn these things into a radar system, which they were totally never designed to be, which I consider like super cool. Um, so if you want to uh, download the source code, it's on my GitHub repo, uh, ztulsa slash PKE. Please feel free to download it, mess with it, build on it, whatever. I have example scripts of how to do everything that I showed you today. Um, I have 
a couple tutorials on how to do captures of your own. Unfortunately, I don't get great radar or sorry, great Wi-Fi reception in the parking lot. So I apologize for not being able to show that as a part of this tutorial. It's really, really simple. I promise all you need is just like one or two SDRs to set up in there to capture your signals and then to go through the analysis. Um, so yeah, thank you for watching. I hope you enjoy uh, and have fun at DEF CON. Bye.